yeah, marginal cost could be increasing, then you would have upward sloping, but won't change at all. The point is, purely, ideas are embodied. It takes time to make and resources to make copies of ideas, and therefore, in general, you will have limited capacity in front of existing demand, and that will allow you to earn rents, competitive rents. In fact, if the marginal cost, here the marginal cost is identical for every player, but every industrial organization guy will tell you that that's not even true. That best producers are best, not only because they innovate, but also because they have lower marginal cost. They're more efficient. So those guys earn extra rents, the inframarginal rents, all the time, like in the Ricardian theory of rents. Right? Now, is this always true? Well, not always. You know, maybe the, in the business, in the market for nuclear plants, the minimum size is so large and the fixed cost is so large that there is no room for more than one player. It doesn't seem to be true because apparently we have more than one worldwide, but it could. That is, when is that this argument fails? This argument fails if the demand function is so downward sloping and the marginal cost is so high, and the fixed cost is so high that even the smallest minimum size allows for very little rents, right? right? So when demand is extremely elastic, and immediately all across, fixed costs are particularly high, and minimum size is particularly high, then we may have a problem. Absolutely. It's an empirical issue. It's not a theoretical issue. There is no theoretical reason whatsoever, nor intuitive historical reason whatsoever, to think that the competitive mechanism Marshall described would not be the one capturing what happens in a new industry, new market. And also there is no theoretical reason to rule out cases in which, again, demand is so elastic that you know there is room only for one size plant. It's an empirical matter. We have to go look at it. We know from empirical research, right, that demand tends to be inelastic at low quantity. Right? That is when a product is new and there are very few units around, right? Even if you sorry, I said the other the demand tends to be elastic a low quantity and then eventually becomes inelastic. That is, at the beginning, as you lower the price, people demand a lot more. Uh, sorry, rewind all that. He was looking at me strange, if I says, what is Michele saying? I inverted elastic and inelastic. This is inelastic. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Just rewind and revert. So when the man is very inelastic all along, <laughs> yeah, because then, you know, I was doing, now the usual story ain't coming out. What did I do? So when the man is inelastic all along, right, you, you don't get, you know, you have to drop prices a lot to get more quantity and then the, 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 the rents disappear. But even in this case, you know, you, the contestable market argument, the competition star is still there. So you oh, yeah, you can use the contest exactly. Yeah, yeah. You can still use the contestable and the potential yeah. entry. Exactly. There's a potential. Yeah. You want to have potential entry, otherwise, even if there is just one guy, he's just going to subproduce. I mean, produce uh, below efficient level at a higher price. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> But in fact, the usual story and most empirical evidence for new goods says what? The man initially is very elastic. Right? Mm -hmm. That was clearly the case for you know, the typical <coughs> example, the cell phone, computers, and so on. So it's good to have a lot of entry that drops price at the beginning, and that, uh, and that increases quantity dramatically. Eventually, demands become inelastic, yes, because pretty much anything tends to have decreasing returns, Eventually, you get to a really marginal consumer, and there's no reason to have more copies of that being produced, but that's what we call a mature industry. Right? The demand for rice would probably not increase at all if we managed to drop the price, at least in China. Even if there's lots of places around the world where 
right, food production is still a problem, and in fact, there's still a lot of research in improving rice production, both quality and quantity. So one has to be careful, right? And same is true for, you know, now everybody has lots of shirts, blue jeans, and T-shirts, but still there's a lot of, you know, many hundreds of millions of people for which the price of our shirts and T-shirts is still too high. So one has to be careful of what the reference market is. But, uh, but that's, um, that's it. That, that's it, I guess. That's what I wanted to tell you in these two days. More, some questions or we'll stop it here? Uh, I have a question. Yeah. The, the, the one case is to uh, from industry one to jump to this, and then what is the difference between the this and the, the, the step by step? So what oh, then I drew only one. I made the graph bigger. No difference. This is just one step. Then it continues. Right. There's another. It's just I wanted to make the graph bigger. There's no difference. It's the same thing. It's just one step. So, so if, if, if I want to jump from the from the industry one to to, to the industry N directly, so so what is different? Well, that's so that's an empirical problem, right? <laughs> so many de one of the reasons developing countries countries that develop late, right? So here is actually one empirical paper somebody should do. I would like to. We can do that, right? We pretty much have decent data for United Kingdom at this point and United States and the Netherlands in the 18, late 18th and 19th century. And then for other European countries. And what I would like to do is the following. Let's order countries in terms of leadership. So the first guys to get to a certain point were clearly England, United, uh, sorry, United Kingdom, United States and France. Right? Then there were, uh, and the Netherlands, then there were catching up countries, the first wave, Germany, uh, the Scandinavian countries and so on, then Italy, right? And then other, right? And eventually, you know, after Second World War, Japan, well, Japan had already started actually, so not Japan, but already started, sorry. But Taiwan, Korea, and then eventually you guys and so on, right? I think that one should say, the amount of time that it took, say, to US or to United Kingdom to go from income 100 to income 1000 was X. The amount of time that it took to China to go from income 100 to income 1000 was a lot less. Why? Because US had to go through all this process. U.S. had to start from technology zero, U.S. or U.K., yeah. grow technology zero, then invent technology one, which is costly, make copies of technology one, then invent technology two, make copies of technology two, and so on. Right? People that came later already had copies of technology four available. All they had to do was to use resources and saving and, and, and output from technology zero to purchase copies of technology four, which is what you did. I remember many years ago being impressed that the last big steel plant by Thyssen, Krupp Thyssen, was being disassembled in the road and literally a whole gigantic plant put in ship and reassembled here. <laughs> it was less, you know, it was literally purchasing the embodied technology. I was fascinated by that story. You know, they, it's not that they made a copy of the plant here. They literally disassembled the plant there. That was less costly and reassembled it here. Right? I, I, I hope that the gates and the walls and the things were built in here. They didn't bring the bricks from Germany. But, you know, the big furnaces and so were disassembled and shipped over. Well, you know, that was a very advanced steel plant that you purchased without going through the steps of innovating, so obviously your productivity, think about, you know, Chinese product, one looks at TF, Chinese TFP in the steel industry. It must have had a gigantic jump, because you went from very primitive steel plants to the most advanced. Right? Same for cars. You went from 
basically no cars or some crappy Russian cars. I remember seeing them my, during my first trip. I mean, I remember Tina men packed with bikes. <laughs> you don't see it anymore. But I remember from the hotel, looking out one morning, the first morning in Beijing, and there was bikes, yeah. motorbikes and very few cars, very few. Yeah. Now, forget it. <laughs> now there are bikes only around the university. Right, because they, if you go around with bikes, they, they'll kill you on the rings, okay? But I remember, and that was 20 years ago. It was not an eternity, it was literally 20 years ago. And so obviously, right, but the point there is because once all the various embodiment are there, you can jump. It's not easy to jump because there's a lot of complementary factor. So you have to be able to, you probably jump... Why is it, I think, that all the jumps is always in basic in industries? You know, steel, because it's relatively easy to build the human capital. So you can easily build the human capital for that and have the most advanced chemical plant, the most advanced. So imagine what it took Germany or England or France to get at the current advanced technology for special steels. It took 250 years. Plant after plant after plant after plant, one technology after the other. But now, right, somebody that comes in into steel production can get almost to the most advanced plant by just adopting and imitating the technology. All they need to have is obviously resources to purchase it. But that's because you don't have to invent, it already exists. You see what I mean? So that's, I think, quite relevant to understand catching up. Which is why I think there is no mystery the newcomer grow much faster, but eventually also slow down. There's no Chinese miracle, Vietnamese miracle, there's no miracle. Right? So, in, in fact, Spain, Italy and so on grew at 7-8% in the 50s and 60s because they were catching up on the US technology, in Germany and, and Japan too, they were catching up and rebuilding. Also, you know, if you rebuild, obviously you grow very fast. Why? Because you already know how to do that thing. You have already preserved knowledge, embodied knowledge. If they kill all your engineers, you know, think at Cambodia. Right? When you wipe out human capital at that level, then it's difficult to catch up because you have to rebuild it. So destroying the human capital of a country is a good example. Of, it's a bad, you know, a, it's a tragic way of producing a perfectly good example that ideas are embodied and are not public good. Right? Because if ideas were really disembodied, they were public good, it shouldn't matter. Right? You could wipe out humans and buildings, boom, you go spring back right away, not true. When you destroy the human capital of a country, you destroy the human capital of a country, it takes generations to build it up. Whereas if you have it, then you just make copies. No miracles, actually. When, when, when one thinks of it, one realizes that there's nothing miraculous about this. Obviously, there's something politically miraculous, but that's another story. You know, to organize the system of incentive, to have a country agree and say, OK, we'll change the rules and change incentives so we behave differently, <laughs> that's a different business. But from the strict descriptive economic point of view, what has happened in Korea, Taiwan, China, now it's happening in Vietnam, is not a particular uh, surprise. It makes sense. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you.